Welcome, welcome to Euler Problem 2, Part 3. <laughs> In this episode, we're going to talk about the little closure program that I wrote that helped me draw those diagrams that you saw in the last episode. I used a particular technique called um, turtle graphics. The device you are looking at here on your screen is called a turtle. It was invented in the 1960s as a way to teach children how to program computers. It's a simple device, a robot that can move forward or back, rotate left or right, and raise and lower a pen. Do you see the pen sitting there in the middle there, drawing? That's how you can draw a picture with turtle graphics. <laughs> The turtle robot was invented by Seymour Papert in the late 1960s. In order to give the children the ability to control the robot, he made some changes to the logo language. Those changes, those additional features, are what we now call turtle graphics. What you're looking at here is a simple turtle graphics emulator. Now I'm going to tell the turtle to turn right 90, and you'll see that it does. Then I'm going to tell the turtle to move forward 100 steps, and you'll see that it draws a nice 100 pixel line. Next, I'm going to select those two commands, and I'm going to repeat them four times. And this should draw a nice little square. That is turtle graphics. Now, I knew that I was going to draw those square spiral and flower petal diagrams that you saw in the last episode. So I said to myself, now why don't I just write a clever little turtle graphics program in Clojure? <laughs> and so that's exactly what I did. I wrote a little turtle graphics processor in Clojure. It's what you're looking at right now. This function I'm highlighting, that's the turtle graphics code. And you can see what it does. It loops four times, right 90, forward 100. So let's execute it. And there it goes, drawing a nice little square, just like the logo one did. Graphics in Clojure is actually pretty simple. There's a, uh, a lovely little framework that you can download called Quill. And it gives you all the tools you need to create a fully event-driven graphical user interface system. So just to give you an idea of the power of this little framework in Clojure, this is a program I wrote some time ago. I call it Space War. It's just a simulation of the Star Trek universe. Here's the Enterprise in green going after the red Klingon. We're going to focus in on that Klingon and see if we can kill him. <laughs> okay, oh, oh, heavens, that Klingon is shooting at us. All right, we better line up. We better rotate our ship and evade those those balls evade those kinetics. Those things will kill us. So we got to rotate and avoid them. Whoa, whoa, close one, close one. Okay, set up your phasers. Set up your phasers. See if you can line. Oh, heavens, he hit, he hit us. He hit us. All right, all right, all right. There he is. There he is. You see him down there? Okay, get the phasers ready. Okay, fire. Fire your phasers. Come on, man. Oh, you missed. You missed. Okay, all right. Take aim. Fire again. Oh, he's shooting torpedoes. He's shooting torpedoes. All right, get ready. Fire again. Fire again. Oh, you missed. You missed. You fool. You died. You died. Ah! <laughs> That's just a little example of the power of closure and quill. <laughs> quill works the way most graphical systems work by using callbacks. You register certain functions with Quill and, and Quill calls those functions whenever it wants to. And Quill likes to draw the screen 30 times a second or 60 times a second in order to keep nice smooth animations going. So that's how often it's going to be calling the draw function that you register with it. So here, let me show you how this works. This is the function that you use right here to uh, set up quill and uh, it's also where we register our callback function so here's where we register the setup function setup function only gets called once at the beginning uh, this is where we register the update function which i called update state and here's where we register the draw function which i called draw state 
It's also where we set up the title of the screen and the size of the screen and a few other things like that. Then Quill takes over and Quill calls us. And it calls our setup function. So our setup function is up here. And you can see here I set the frame rate to 60. So I want really smooth, uh, smooth animations. I told it to use RGB color and so on. And set up a little bit of um, stuff. And I'll come back to this in a little while because it's important. Uh, and here is the update function. The update function gets called before each draw. So this is where we update the data structures before we draw them. So we do the animation processing in update state, and then we simply draw the changed data structures in draw state. And here's the draw function. And I'm not going to go through that right now. I just want you to kind of see the structure of what we're dealing with. Now, if you've written a GUI program once or twice, you might be able to see the problem here, right? Uh, Turtle Graphics wants to run in a sequence of steps, a nice little script. And that script uses functions like forward and write. And forward will run for two or three seconds, and write might run for two or three seconds. And yet, Quill is what's drawing everything, and Quill wants to call callbacks 60 times a second. So there's no direct way for me to execute a turtle graphic script in the midst of this 60 cycles per second callback. Now this is nothing unusual. Right? It's the typical kind of scheduling mismatch you run into. Whenever you're using a framework like Quill that has a very particular dominant scheduling scheme and you want to mix it with some other kind of scheduling scheme like logo turtle graphics and whenever you have a scheduling mismatch like that the solution is almost always threads so what I'm gonna to need to do is have quill run in the background and quill is gonna call the three callback functions to set up update and draw every uh, so often, like every 60th of a second or so. And then I'm going to have to run my turtle graphics script in another thread. So I'll have the setup start that thread. And then the turtle graphics script is going to have to communicate through a channel to some handler that will update the data structure that describes the screen. I call that the turtle. And then the update callback will also update the turtle to animate it. And then the draw function will read from the turtle to draw it on the screen. Now think about that animation that you saw when I had my turtle graphics system draw that square. You know, the, the functions like right and forward they're going to somehow have to manage that animation. What I mean by that is this. You see this call to right? It's going to turn the turtle right by 90 degrees, but that rotation takes it, oh, I don't know, maybe a quarter of a second or so. And you can see on the screen the turtle rotating, which means that this function must be executing somehow for that length of time and it only returns when the turtle has completed and then that allows of course the next function to be called which would be forward 100. Once again that forward 100 does not take place immediately. The turtle moves at a certain velocity so this forward function does not return until the turtle reaches its final destination. Now while all that is going on the draw function is getting called 60 times a second. And so something here must be updating the data structures that are being drawn in order to set the angle of the turtle incrementally millisecond by millisecond and move the turtle forward incrementally millisecond by millisecond so that the drawing function draws them in the right place at the right time and well, I think you can see that there's quite a scheduling mismatch here. <laughs> now, to really dig in and understand this mismatch, I think it would be helpful if I showed you just how the turtle and the lines were being drawn. So let's start here at the main function. This is where we call def sketch, which is how Quill gets initialized. And uh, this is also where we register the draw function, the draw callback, 
and that's called draw state. So up here is the draw state method. And you can see that it sets the background to a certain color and it sets the origin to 500, 500. Then it fetches the turtle from the state variable, which is passed in. And then it calls turtle slash draw with the turtle. So uh, let's go there and we'll see how that works. Okay, here is the draw function for the turtle. This is where everything happens. And uh, if the pen is down, <laughs> Then we set the stroke color to black and we set the stroke weight to the weight of the turtle. And then we draw a line which begins at wherever the pen started and goes to the current position of the turtle. So this is the line between where the pen went down and where the turtle is at the moment. Now, the next thing that happens is that we call do seek on a list of lines. These are all the lines that were previously drawn by the turtle. And once again, we set the stroke weight to the line weight and we set the, uh, the lines here. We just draw the line from where the line started to where the line ended and so on. So that draws the whole list of lines that had been previously drawn by the turtle. And then if the turtle is visible, <laughs> Then we set the stroke weight to one, and the next batch of code here simply draws that cute little triangle. And uh, you can see here that it it moves the uh, triangle by translating it to the to the position, and it rotates the triangle by rotating it by the heading of the turtle. And that heading is calculated up here by taking the heading of the turtle and converting it to radians, because Quill likes radians. And, I like degrees for uh, for the uh, the right and left functions. And that's really it. That's how the turtle is drawn. In fact, that's how everything is drawn right with that function right there. So you can see that there's this list of lines that must be getting accumulated gradually, slowly as the uh, the turtle graphics functions execute. That draw function inspects a data structure that represents the turtle, and of course it draws what that data structure represents. So perhaps we should look into the schema of that data structure to really understand what's going on here. So here's what that schema looks like. This is the schema for the turtle itself. And you'll notice that it's made up of a, a dictionary that has a number of named variables. There's the position variable and the heading variable and the velocity variable that tells us how fast the turtle is moving. And here's the distance that it needs to traverse, the remaining distance that it needs to traverse in whatever direction it happens to be going. Here's the angular velocity of the turtle as it's turning and the target angle it must reach. This is the state of the pen, whether it's up or down. This is the weight of the line that it's drawing. This is the overall speed of everything taking place. This is the list of lines that the turtle had previously drawn. Here's the state of the turtle, whether it's visible or not, and other state information as well. This is the uh, overall schema of the turtle. And, and if you look up here, for example, you can see the definition of position by looking up here and see, oh yeah, position is really just a tuple of two numbers, X and Y. And heading, for example, is just a number and it must be between zero and 360. And velocity is just a number and distance is just a number and so on and so on and so on. That last state, that one down here, that's an interesting one because you see that it can be idle or busy. <laughs> busy means that it is currently executing a turtle script command, a turtle graphics command. Idle means that it's done executing the last turtle graphics command. <laughs> that schema ought to give you a hint that there's quite a bit going on behind the scenes here. So in order to dive into what's going on behind the scenes, Let's look at one of the turtle graphics commands like um, forward. So here's the forward command and it's, pardon the pun, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it takes a distance as the argument. So this is the distance we're going to move in the forward direction. And all this function does is it builds a little tuple here. That's a vector. 
uh, and the vector has the forward um, keyword in it and the distance. And it sends that vector, that tuple, through this channel using this um, channel send command. Uh, now this is asynchronous, so it will return immediately and it'll put this tuple into the channel for someone else to read, someone else in a different thread. We'll look at that in just a minute. The, uh, the script will then continue. The forward function will return almost immediately, but then the next function will call async send and it'll block because there's no one reading the channel at that point. So the whole thing will freeze right there. The, the turtle graphics script will freeze right there because there's no one reading the channel. The, the channel reader has to finish the forward command first before it goes back and reads. So that's how we do this scheduling. By the way, this channel system here, uh, that's very similar to the kind of channels you would have in Go or Elixir or Erlang. Real, real similar idea. Very, very powerful idea as well. So you can see that the turtle graphics script sends commands through a channel, right? It executes in one thread and it sends commands through a channel to another thread. So what threads are those? To see how those two threads get started, we need to look at the other callbacks here. There's the setup callback and the update callback. The setup callback is executed only once. And you can see here, this is where we set up the frame rank. I showed you this before, right? Okay. But here's where we create the channel. And here is where we create the next thread. This is the thread for the turtle script. So the turtle script executes underneath this go command, which actually spawns a new thread or something thread like. <laughs> it's an asynchronous execution environment. So the turtle script is running in that separate asynchronous environment, probably another thread. Now we need to look at update because that's where the channel is received. So remember that update is called before every draw. The way quill works is that update is called and then draw is called and then update is called and then draw is called 60 times a second. <laughs> so update is going to be called 60 times a second from quill. And if we look at that, we will see there is this handle commands. <laughs> now, if we look at handle commands, we're going to see, oh, we're going to be polling the channel. But we're only going to pull the channel if the state of the turtle is idle. If the state of the turtle is busy, we're not going to pull the channel. And so anyone who's waiting to write on that channel is going to have to block. The turtle graphic script is going to block until the state of the turtle is idle. Now, once the state of the turtle is idle, then we pull the channel and we pull the command out of it. And if that command is nil, well, there must not be anything in the channel and therefore we return from handle commands with the turtle. But if that command was not nil, well, then we pass that command to handle command. <laughs> and then we recur to go get the next command to see if there's anything left in the channel. So effectively, we will take every command queued up on the channel as fast as we can, handle them, and if there are no commands left, we return from handle commands. The handle command function is pretty straightforward. All it does is set up the initial state of the turtle right as the command begins, and, and then it's the update function that actually executes the animation. So, for example, here is the handle command function. You can see what it does. It just checks to see what kind of command it is. And for example, if it is a forward command, then it just calls this forward function. And that function, well, it's pretty, pretty easy. It just sets up the turtle 
with the velocity that the turtle needs in order to draw the line. That just comes from the default speed of the turtle. And it also tells the turtle how far to draw. So that's the remaining distance before the turtle is done. And then we uh, set the state of the turtle to busy and that will prevent handle commands from pulling the channel again. It'll wait until the turtle goes idle before trying to get the next command. So here's the update function once again. And this is what I did not show you the last time when we looked at this function. This is where we update the turtle. So before we go handle the commands, we go update the turtle first. Let's look at updating the turtle. Okay, updating the turtle, pretty straightforward. First thing I do here is make sure that the, uh, the turtle's type, the schema, is still correct. All right, so this is actually a post condition of this. Once we've updated the turtle, we make sure that the turtle still matches the schema. The next thing we do is we check to see if the state of the turtle is idle. And if it is, well, then we just return the turtle and bail out of here. There's no update to do. We're not working on any command if we're idle. If we're not idle, however, then there's some work to do. So we're going to get the distance and the state and the angle and the lines and the position and all this stuff. We're going to get it out of the turtle. And then we're going to call update position and then update heading. Now, I'm going to talk about those in just a minute. But before, before I talk about those, once we have updated the position and the heading, then we check to see if we're done with this command. And the way you get done with a command is to either have zero distance to travel if we're going in the forward direction or zero angle to rotate if we're turning the turtle. So if those two are zero, then we must be done. And if we are done, then we will set the state to idle. <laughs> we are also going to take the last line drawn by the turtle <laughs> And we're going to put it in the lines list. So that's how we accumulate all the lines that the turtle has drawn. And then we update the pen start field to say that, okay, the next time we draw something, it's going to start here probably. And then we associate all those variables back into the turtle and we're done updating the turtle. Okay, so how do you update the position? Well, Updating the position is pretty straightforward, right? What we're going to do is compute the next step. Now, the next step happens to be the velocity of the turtle. We, we, you know, this gets called 60 times a second. So you could think of this step as being, you know, 1 60th of the velocity or something like that. Actually, actually the velocity is in 60th. So that is the step. Of course, um, sometimes the, um, the distance remaining is less than the velocity, and that's why we have this min function. And then, of course, we subtract from the distance to travel the step, uh, and that shortens the remaining distance. Then if the step is negative, we invert it, right? Okay, so that we can walk in the right direction. And we, it, we have to do, deal with the fact that we might be moving at an angle, so we get the heading and convert it to radians. And then we do all this trigonometry to figure out what the components of x and y are. And then, then we change the position of x by the components and the position of y by the components. And, and then we just uh, put all those bits of data back into the turtle and return the turtle. <laughs> and that is how we update position. Updating heading is almost exactly the same thing, except we do it with angle instead of with position. So that is how we do all of that animation. This is the second thread that does all the reading and processing, and it runs 60 times a second. So now all that's left is to see how the turtle gets updated from millisecond to millisecond. And, of course, that takes place in the update callback. And that is how you draw turtle graphics in Clojure. If you'd like to inspect the code, maybe learn a little bit more about it, maybe run the unit tests that I didn't show you, here's the URL that you can download that code from. It's up in GitHub, up in my normal GitHub library, so have fun with that. Anyway, I hope you learned something, I hope you enjoyed this, and I bet that you just can't wait for Euler Problem 3. <laughs>